Good morning, everybody. It's a little after nine now, so I think we'll pick things off. Uh, welcome to JKMRC Friday Seminar Series. Before we begin, on behalf of the Sustainable Minerals Institute and the University of Queensland, I'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagara people as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their to, to their ancestors and their descendants, and who continue cultural and spiritual connection with country and we recognise their valuable contribution to Australian and global society. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Liguang Wang. Dr. Wang is a senior lecturer in the School of Chemical Engineering here at UQ. Uh, he obtained his PhD in Mining and Minerals Engineering from Virginia Tech, and a BE and an ME in Minerals Engineering from Central South University. His research has resulted in several international patent disclosures and over 90 refereed publications on flotation dewatering and particle technology. He was honoured with the Research and Industry Excellent Award of the Australian Coal Industry Research Program. Today's presentation is entitled New Methods of Flotation, Process, Intensification and Monitoring. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Liguang Wang. It's my pleasure, uh, pleasure to be here today and to report to you some of our latest uh, results on flotation. Um, so first, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, my co-workers. Um, so Dr. Angel Park, Hans, is still with me working on flotation. And, and Jane, and gave a presentation about um, um, flotation with Austria supply, I think about two years ago. Um, so today, I just briefly cover some contents, some latest development about uh, flotation with the Australia supply. So she's now working for a large engineering company in Beijing as a chief scientist. And so Dr. Lisha Dong is now at uh, Curtin University and she worked on um, graphite flotation with the Australia supply. And uh, Bing Yu and recently John Ray Tinto. And so she worked on flotation with uh, Acoustic sound. And Dr. Charlie and, and Brad Ed from JK and for his uh, PhD studies. And he worked uh, with me for two years as a postdoc research fellow. And he worked on flotation with uh, Austria as well. So Dr. Chung Yong um, recently joined uh, Anglo American. So he worked uh, on flotation with sound. The problems we are working on is really for not only co-flotation, but many other mineral flotation systems. And uh, the common problem we have is uh, um, the efficiency is not uh, as high as we expected. And we want to increase um, the recovery and we want to stabilize the, the separation efficiency. So here, I just give you an example. And we actually observe from the side work and um, so this is uh, just a daily variation of combustible carbon or coal um, flotation operation. So we found a large variation. So day one, day two, day three, you can see. So the combustible carbon reflected a lot. So is there any way that we can stabilize uh, the operation efficiency and uh, can we also improve the recovery? So we ask this question and we want to um, develop some uh, new methods to try to improve the recovery efficiency. And also uh, we can monitor the flotation process. So with that, uh, in the last uh, several years, and we develop uh, a few different methods. So here I just highlight two methods for process intensification for flotation. So the first one is also the air supply. And um, we just briefly uh, cover some of the contents of the Austria air supply because most of the content has been covered by Jane. Um, and so next topic is low frequency sound. And uh, I think I will spend probably half of the time and try to get focused and give you more information about low frequency sound, how we can improve uh, flotation efficiency. And with a uh, low power um, acoustic sound, low frequency. And then for the process monitoring control, and we, we develop a drag sensor. This is actually a mass pool sensor, and we can 
and closely monitor the flotation mass recovery or yield in co-flotation and in real time. So this is a very simple and uh, is also a low cost uh, effective methods to do monitoring in real time. And uh, the last one, I briefly just uh, mentioned uh, contribution to frother concentration environments, including the stand industry standard frother for co that is MIBC, and uh, also some uh, frother blends. I'll just give you an example for frother blends like uh, MIBC and a PPG, uh, like glyco based frother like across the blends, and we can also um, measure the individual components concentration. And so first, the Australia supply. And so we, we learned from uh, University of Sheffield's professor Zimmerman, so William Zimmerman, uh, had a lot of work about uh, how to improve gas dispersion and uh, also he applied the uh, flotation to recover microalgae from from water. So this harvesting uh, of uh, uh, microalgae by flotation, so in bubbles, because microalgae uh, algae are naturally hydrophobic, so you can recover microalgae by bubbles. And uh, they developed a fluid oscillator to be able to generate small bubbles using um, some spudgers. Okay. And so we found that it's uh, relevant to flotation. And uh, so can we actually and test this technology for co-flotation. So that is sponsored by uh, one of the ACAP projects. And uh, we did test and we found that uh, indeed we can generate smaller bubbles so we can improve flotation kinetics. Uh, we found that uh, it was rather difficult to learn the technique and how to control the, the fluid oscillator. And uh, the problem is uh, they waste a lot of uh, air supplied to the flotation cell. There were only a pr small proportion of air can be used to generate small bubbles. And uh, so we actually extended this work to try to find alternative ways um, to generate small bubbles using Australia supply. So today I'll give you uh, some highlights about uh, some uh, sonic air valve um, so we can um, have a faster switching of uh, an air supply on and off at a high speed so we can show you um, the potential of this uh, methods for improving flotation efficiency. And so that's why the, then we did uh, solid solid separation in co-flotation and also mineral uh, flotation here at UQ. So first I just give you the idea that if we use the same column, um, flotation column, so conventional, um, flotation column, if you sup supply steady air into the system and you have a spudger, you generate some bubbles and you can actually collect uh, your um, concentration and tail and you can evaluate flotation efficiency. So we found that, that the bubble size uh, has got a wide distribution and you have coarse bu bubbles, you have some really fine bubbles. But if you have a um, austere air supply into the column and through the spudger, you can find a more uniform, smaller bubbles. And so here you can see that we use a 50 micron full size spudger. And we use this sonic valve to convert steady air to SVL. And we can find a huge difference in gas dispersion. And also we found a big difference in flotation efficiency. So here you can see that we, we can measure um, the instant air pressure, air pressure for output air. And this is continuous air, so there's no change in air pressure, but if you have a conversion of the uh, continuous air to austere air, and you can measure instant pressure as a function of time, and you can find this uh, uh, oscillation of air supply. So and intuitively, we, we look at, observe uh, what, what is difference in gas dispersion with or without this outer air supply. So on the right hand side, you can see much finer bubbles, more uniform bubbles generated using um, the austere air supply. And uh, on the left hand side, it's just a steady air supply and conventional methods for you to generate bubbles. And we did uh, also some measurements, uh, the bubble size measurements. So, so because we have a little bit amount of time today, so I, I chose not to actually include these bubble size measurements by the but the general finding is that we can greatly reduce bubble size and we can 
even and reduce the CCC is called a critical coalescence concentration. So that parameter CCC is, a, is definitely not a just a related to property, material property is also related to hydrodynamic conditions. So, so Chow, Chow did uh, some measurements uh, using like coarse particles and uh, it's just a single uh, mineral particle. Um, yeah, this is column, column flotation, puts the multiple particles, silic particles into it. And we want, we want to see whether um, it, the improvement of uh, flotation recovery is a function of particle size. We, indeed, we found that uh, uh, for every particle size, uh, um, we measured. So first we do the saving, we get subsamples and each subsample has got narrow size distribution. So we have auto fines and uh, some fine particles and even coarser particles and then send the samples to the flotation cell. And so we can measure the recovery. And we found that, uh, so for auto fine particles, you have a significant increase in flotation recovery. And also for coarse particles, so without, so just a steady air conventional flotation. So we barely recover any particles, but if you use our steel supply and we can have uh, close to like eight, 10% uh, recovery. So that tells you that uh, potentially if you use our steel supply, you can improve for ultrafine particle flotation and also coarse particle flotation. Um, so next one is a way we also did some tests for looking at can we actually improve maximum carrying capacity. So for column flotation, we know that uh, and uh, one of the limitations uh, for column flotation is a uh, very low uh, carrying capacity. So can we improve carrying capacity? And so what we did is we just to change the, the fade solids content. If we fix uh, the, the phase volumetric flow rate at, the, at this uh, level. And we just changed the phase solids content from 2.5% uh, up to 15%. So, and we found that uh, you, you always have a peak um, in the carrying frost carry rate and for steady air supply, and you can get a carry rate roughly like 0 0.75. And uh, then if you use our steady supply and they can easily and go to about it's like 1.75. So that tells you that you can somehow, uh, if you just change uh, the phase solids content and you can find uh, the maximum carry rate uh, for this condition, there's a significant increase in the, the frost carry rate. And the next one is if we fix uh, the solids content for co-flotation, the typical industry phase solids content is roughly five to 7.5%. So we fix this phase solids content, we just change volumetric flow rate of fade. So, so we can, so double, triple, even four times higher, and we can find a, a maximum current, current capacity is around three. So around three times per, uh, per square meters. And uh, compare the standard one, steady air supply, and uh, roughly 1.00 maximum. Uh, carrying weight. So this is, um, this matches well with uh, in the, like, uh, the, the literature that so the people measured co-flotation. So typically maximum carrying capacity is around one. So here we can increase to three, that is three. And so the previous slide shows you results with uh, obtained at a laboratory scale. And then we, we tried a, uh, some palasco column. And so basically we, we increase the diameter of the column by many times, like uh, from five centimeter to 17 centimeter. And uh, we also use a, sorry, we also use a homemade uh, a device to try to convert our supply um, because the volumetric flow is much larger and uh, we, we have a homemade uh, device. And we actually overcame the problem with the scaling up because the sonar value is very small and our supply is very low. It's suitable for lab scale tests, but not for ballast scale or full scale. So we, we developed this uh, 
the device and then we did pilot scale tests and we found uh, that we can confirm uh, the lab scale test results. So you still can have significant improvement in the flotation mass recovery. So, so we expect the industrial trial, uh, the Palascot continuous smoke uh, can happen sometime uh, this year, maybe later this year. Okay, so the, now I want to move to the next method is uh, um, the flotation with acoustic sound. And uh, the, per the reason why we did that is uh, uh, it's driven by this uh, challenge faced by the coal industry, especially cooking coal industry. There's an over frosting problem. Um, so, so basically, um, the hydrophobic coal particles um, with uh, so you have to control the frost concentration. So not a, a very high frost dosage so that you can avoid uh, overly stable frost. So the frost discharge from the flotation cell should have a very short uh, lifetime. So they won't have a very fast uh, frost destruction. So you can, uh, you can actually pump this frost and then to do dewatering, so solid liquid suppression. And however, in the coal industry, is, uh, this problem is, uh, is a severe. Uh, in many cases, you found that uh, you have to greatly reduce fossil dosage in order to prevent uh, this problem. Um, so, so the question is, uh, if you want to actually uh, use chemical methods, um, and so for example, if you want to maximize your flotation yield, and it's very important for you to apply a kind of high level of fossil concentration. And so the problem is that you do not know actually the fossil concentration in the plant water when you reduce, recycle the water. And so, so if you recycle the water many times, you have built up the fossil in the, in the plant water surface, and that will cause the over frosting problem. Okay, so there are two things that we need to solve. Is one is that um, are there any methods that we can actually have locally stabilized frost within flotation cell? So, so certainly this cannot be achieved by using chemical methods by finding a different frosser or just control the frosser concentration. And um, another one is can you measure frosser concentration in the plant water? So actually we, we did uh, both. So the first thing is that we won't have uh, non-chemical methods to, to solve this problem. So we start from uh, fundamental studies and which uh, was one of the topics that uh, I'm dealing with when I did my PhD stu uh, studies. So this is a uh, foam films stability. And we want to study the surface forces in foam films confined between two bubbles relevant to flotation. And if you want to study surface forces, then it's important to control the condition of foam film to be quiescent um, so that you limit or minimize the hydrodynamic condition or the dynamic forces. Um, so we did the studies and um, pretty much about uh, how to change uh, surfactant concentrations, surfactant type and uh, electrolyte concentrations. And we, we did understand the foam film better through these studies at the quiescent conditions. However, we found that uh, that's something that uh, we cannot understand and uh, just like that quiescent condition. So for example, if you use these foam film studies, so the foam, sun liquid film, horizontal film formed uh, in this capillary ring, ring cell, okay. And uh, so you just uh, suck liquid out, you can have a silicon film and you can measure lifetime. Um, so we plot this lifetime as a function of a uh, uh, sodium chloride concentration without any surfactants. So we can measure lifetime and we found lifetime is uh, going down when you increase uh, sodium chloride concentration. And we found that the tendency of bubble class is actually increasing. Okay. So next one is, uh, um, the Wenscraig, Professor Wenscraig uh, published a paper in Nature when he was just the final year undergrad students. Um, so he, he did the studies by measuring turbidity of this uh, uh, gas dispersion states in column with the bubble bubbling, bubbling column. So certainly this is a dynamic condition. 
Um, so it measures a light intensity as a function of a certain chloride concentration without adding surfactants. So he found that actually that the tendency of bubble cleanse is going down. And so this is uh, probably familiar to many of you working on flotation, especially when you're dealing with so silent water. And people found that uh, in silent water, if you see water, highly silent water, you don't have to add any faucet in many cases, especially for cold flotation. So, so why there is opposite trends? So in, under quiescent condition, the tendency of bubble cleanse is going up okay, when you increase uh, the electric concentration. And then under dynamic condition, the trend is opposite. So the chemical condition is exactly the same. So this uh, encourages us to actually find out why. So we did uh, studies uh, many years uh, on full film studies so, uh, on the quiescent condition. So, um, so same as uh, is far away from the real condition in flotation system. So that, that's why that we actually started work, looking at, can we actually introduce some dynamic effect to the foam film studies? So what we do is, uh, so we have this, uh, this, uh, this is just a porous disc and then we, are, we have drill a hole and it soaks this into solution and you can suck it out and it can form a foam field. So, um, so you can control the speed of sucking out the liquid by using a nano pump. So we borrowed a nano pump from Professor Andrew's group and we can control the suction rate. So if you suck the liquid out at a higher speed, then the, the two air water interface will be approaching at a higher speed. And so another way is uh, if we let this uh, open to air, we just uh, compress the air. Okay, at a, so at a higher pressure, then they will force the two air water interface to approach at higher speed. So two alternative ways so that we can actually control the air water interface approaching speed because for foam film, you have two air water interfaces. So here, just on the right-hand side, I can show you that if we just control the suction weight, okay, so this is low approach speed of two air water interface. This is intermediate, this is high, and at intermediate, the foam film actually, you can see the lifetime is longer and finally ruptured. So, so just to uh, show you that as a summary, um, sub figure A shows you that uh, we repeated many times. Uh, we did that for pure water. Foam film was formed from pure water. So we measured the lifetime and uh, we found that the indeed, so it's highly repeatable. So at intermediate suction rate, the lifetime was maximum. The next one is uh, if we allow this uh, side uh, capital tube open to air and we just uh, compress uh, the, the film at a different pressure. So at inter intermediate pressure, so you can see the, the film lifetime was maximum. So that tells you that indeed the film lifetime is highly dependent on the dynamic condition. So with that and uh, we actually did further studies. Uh, can we actually apply some uh, mechanical vibration induced, induced by sound? So, so here, just to show you that uh, for foam film, no sound introduced. So the film will rupture within 16 seconds. And uh, this is actually a highly um, silent water. Okay, so repository is minimal. So you can see the films, uh, unstable. However, if you, under the same condition, if you introduce sound into the foam film, and we found that there's vigorous rotational flows within the foam film, and uh, there's, there's no rupture. So it stays there forever. So that tells you that indeed, if you introduce some sound um, to the system, and you might be able to stabilize bubbles. So with this, and uh, we did flotation tests, and then we have loudspeaker. So we have two ways to apply the sound. The first one is uh, we place a loudspeaker in air, just on top of flotation cell. And then next one is, uh, this is calming flotation. And the next one is mechanical, the JK bottom driven mechanical cell. And we 
insert a, a loudspeaker. This is a waterproof loudspeaker. And uh, so we did both and uh, we found an advantage of using the underwater speaker is uh, obviously the noise level is much lower. And uh, so it was not a, a nice experience when you did a flotation test with the loudspeaker installed above in the air, the noise level is very high. And we tried both and we found that the results were, were quite comparable. So here, um, so with a carbon flotation with an airborne loudspeaker, and we can see that uh, we changed the frost concentration, um, the low to high, and this is cold flotation. So at any frost concentration, if you switch on the sound, so you can have a rapid increase in recovery. So, and another thing that I just to tell, tell us is if we want to achieve uh, a mass recovery, so roughly like uh, 70%, and we sound you only need 10 ppm per MIBC. So that tells you that you might be able to save one third of frosting. So that uh, is linked to over frosting problem. Can we actually localize, locally stabilize a frost with a lower frost concentration. Okay. So after that, for the discharge frost, and because the frost concentration is lower, so the, the bubbles were quickly burst. And uh, so there's no issue for, for frost handling and uh, the devoting process. Okay, so we also tried the uh, uh, the effect of sound at the different uh, superficial air velocity. So, so you can see that any given, so JG, and you can also see the significant increase in the recovery. And again, if you want to achieve the same recovery and you can save, you can save air, air supply. So, so you, do ha you don't have to actually have a very large uh, compressor. Okay. Because in most cases, the plant has, has been running the air compressor at the maximum capacity. All right, so we also did uh, size by size recovery uh, using silica as a model particle and we did flotation test. So the, the mass recovery plotted against uh, the, the different size fractions. And we've also found that uh, this is mechanical cell for very fine particles. So we already got a very high recovery. So it's a little scope for you to further improve by sound, but for coarse particles, we found that uh, for this size fraction, you can see without sound, uh, so without sound, so no recovery of this silica particles, but if you apply sound, and we can, re we can recover roughly like 20%. So that again tells you that uh, there's potential for you to improve coarse particle flotation, and if you use uh, acoustic sound. And we tried a co-flotation using sound. And uh, so here shows you the, the yield and versus product uh, ash. So you can see that uh, this is just batch mode in, and in the lab and that the final cumulative uh, mass is, uh, is higher with sound. And also you can see the curve is actually to the left and shows you that there's potential for you to get a cleaner product and at the same flotation yield. And so we, we also look at the, the flotation kinetics. And so flotation rate constant, uh, we did curve fitting no matter which, uh, which model you use. So we always found a significant increase in the rate, flotation rate constant. So, for curve flotation, we found at least a 20% increase in flotation rate. And uh, for silica flotation, we, we got even higher flotation rate constant, 50%. And for chocopyrite, um, the rate constant, this is pure chocopyrite particles. Um, we apply some, uh, so, some uh, sanitite and we did flotation and we found that you can increase the rate constant by 30%. So we look at uh, frost images with without sound and uh, 
So you can say that on the right hand side with sand, and so we can have smaller bubbles in the frost, more uniform. And so this is silica flotation. And uh, another interesting thing is uh, you can see the power frost interface has uh, has been lifted up by using sand. Okay, so indicating in the bulk phase, the average gas holdup has also been increased with sand. And so this slide really just show you that uh, the, if you apply sand within flotation cell, you can have locally stabilized frost. So what we have is first, uh, if you look at uh, the overflowing frost, okay, so just before you discharge as product, so flotation with sand, you can have uh, smaller, smaller, more uniform surface bubbles, and then so this is a flotation without sound. And you can see that the flotation tests were done at 10 ppm, and maybe it's the same for the concentration. So flotation without sound, you can have some coarse, very large bubbles. And so for the discharge frost, and after several minutes, the same amount of time, and you can see that the bubbles were gone. Okay. So that means that the same same frost dosage, okay? So the major issue is about what's happening within flotation cell. So the, for the discharge frost, there's uh, no difference as long well as the, the flotation, the frost concentration is the same. So we have another picture showing you that, um, as I mentioned before, um, because we did test a different frost concentration with video sound, the similar performance, flotation performance was achieved at uh, 10 ppm MIBC with sound compared to 15 ppm without sound. So let's compare at the same flotation performance. So 10 ppm processor dosage, lower dosage with sound. So after five minutes, all bubbles were gone okay, so for the discharge frost. And then for 15 ppm MIBC without sound, this conventional way, conventional, like typical dosage of MIBC, and we found still a large amount of frost bubbles left there. This will definitely cause some over frosting problem if you apply a higher MIBC dosage 15 ppm using conventional way. So, so this uh, slide shows you that with acoustic sound, it can locally stabilize the frost within flotation system. Yeah. And then we did uh, some pilot scale co-flotation tests uh, using this technique, and uh, we just insert uh, a loud speaker with power 30 watts into this uh, pilot scale column with diameter, so it's 17 centimeter. And so this, uh, this is a picture showing you the, the loudspeaker inserted within flotation cell. And on the left-hand side, um, so the results shows you that uh, flotation combustible recovery as a function of time, the cumulative flotation combustible recovery. And uh, so you can see that with sound, at any flotation time, you have increase in flotation combustible recovery. And if you fade this to, to the model, the, the equation, and you can actually get a floating grid constant. So if you use sound, you can increase the floating grid constant by like 22%. And on the, on the right-hand side, it shows you the, the performance curve. So the cumulative yield mass recovery versus cumulative product ash. And you can also see that uh, at any given yield, the, you're gonna clean the product with sound. Okay. And we did the statistical analysis following Professor Tim Napiman's uh, paper, published maybe 10 years ago. So how to compare two separation curves. And we did uh, analyze this by uh, plotting this uh, first on our operating curve. And we did analysis and found indeed that there's a real difference in these two separation curves. Okay. 
So that tells you that potentially you can use sun to get a cleaner product. So as we know that uh, if the product ash is lower, um, potentially can reduce uh, the scope three emission um, for steel making um, industry. All right, so I've already covered uh, um, these two methods for flotation intensification. So now I just uh, have a few, only a few slides to just quickly show you um, the methods we developed to monitor the flotation process and especially the mass pool and then how to measure uh, frosted concentration. So here, just to show you, um, this is a video. So let me go back. So you can see that we have installed actually two sensors here. This is two drag sensors and you actually only need one. So we installed two uh, at the site. This is the implant test. And this is a large microcell flotation column. Um, so this is a, a pedal and then this is a, a string gauge Two We have two string gauge attached here and then we can actually uh, monitor the def uh, deformation because you have a overfrosting frost actually and you apply or force because of deformation and you can actually collect the information and using computer. So the basic principle is here that we have this overflowing frost we installed to this uh, sensor here and we have a two string gauge. So without any overflowing frost and uh, loading the force is zero, the signal output is close to zero. And if you have overflowing frost, you can see this part is uh, stretching, this one is compression, but uh, we, we actually collect signal from these two string gauges and we can convert the output of drag sensor okay, to plot this one against the uh, flotation mass recovery. And we, so we link this two together and we've got a strong, very strong linear um, correlation between mass recovery and uh, the drag sensor. Okay. So, so we did this uh, implant demonstration um, in 2019, so uh, near the end of 2019. And so now um, we are trying to actually test a bit more for other you know, flotation systems. So for the real um, flotation system, another plan is to try to actually look at multiple flotation cells and to, to try to further test this technology. Um, and we also found us one interesting thing is uh, at, uh, at this plant test, uh, we actually, we were allowed, fortunately we were allowed to change uh, a lot of parameters, including fossil concentration from very low to very high and uh, air flow rate as well. So you can see that uh, we can, we got a very low um, flotation yield and uh, very high, so standard flotation yield. And so the, the quality data is pretty good and uh, we got very strong support from the site. Okay. And so we also look at uh, under the best practice standard condition. So standard frost concentration, standard uh, ratio rate. And uh, there's a significant change in the fate ash content that we actually look at uh, how the sensor responded to the change in the fate ash. So we found also a very strong correlation. So um, if you're interested, you can actually look at our paper um, published uh, and um, together with this, uh, this results, this is part of the results showing you um, the capability of this sensor to, to monitor mass pool. And the last one I want to cover um, is a uh, how to measure frost concentration, and especially if you want to if you want to manage frost concentration in a plant, uh, especially in cold flotation. You, you got to be able to measure um, the frost concentration in plant water. Um, so 
there are many different ways to, to do and uh, previous literature, um, for example, they, they actually link uh, frost concentration with dynamic foam stability. So, however, um, so the repeatability is uh, very poor. There are many other ways. But one of the methods developed by McGill University, Professor Finch's group, um, say, so that method was, uh, um, was uh, very accurate and uh, they did also plan the audit. So we tried to use that one to compare with our method. Okay. So, and the McGill's method uh, is based on, is actually chromatic methods. They use chemical reactions to try to change the color of the solution. They can use UV spectrometer to monitor the trust of concentration. However, for our system, and uh, we want to use a simple, fast way, and we use chemical. Uh, we do not use chemical methods. Uh, we use just uh, um, some formulated liquid, and we use a very simple mixing uh, within seconds. So we can actually um, prepare this sample with uh, formulated liquid, and we we can measure um, the spectral signal from UV. So the K is uh, the formulated liquid. Um, so here we, we have a, a pyrene solvent molecule and this one is cavity. This is a second dextrin. This is a, a molecule with a, with a cavity here and cavity can have form a binary, com, com, a binary with this pyrene. Okay, and then any frost molecules, flotation frost molecules. Okay, so they can actually form a ternary with this. Further. So, so the combination of this one, affinity of this, uh, this one is uh, depending on the, the chain lengths and also the, you, you see every frost molecule has a functional group of which hydroxide functional group. And uh, we found that this method works for the linear chain. It's more like a linear chain molecules. And if you have cycling molecules and signal is a bit weaker, so any changes on the spectral, uh, UV spectral, this signal change is very weaker for cyclic uh, process. A glycol-based one is even weaker. So this method is very useful for MIBC and or other aliphatic uh, alcohol, um, like uh, short-chain alcohol uh, frost molecules. So we found that that if you under UV spectrometer and you can find that uh, from, uh, from low concentration MIBC to 5, 10, 20 ppm MIBC, so you can see the a clear shift of these spectral lines. Okay, spectral will shift clearly uh, at a wave number around uh, 339. So if we plot this rate of change in the absorbance uh, against uh, the MIBC concentration, we got a very strong linear relationship. And we use this one um, as a base to try to actually measure frost concentration from, from plant water. And uh, because in the plant water, we do have some other contaminants like diesel collector or some uh, electrolytes. And we found that uh, we have to actually further improve formulation. There is one, one uh, species that we need to include is alpha CD and try to actually eliminate uh, impact from diesel. And we also add some, uh, some uh, mycinal solvents. And we, we found that uh, this will greatly minimize any negative impact from contaminants. So then we, we collect samples from our uh, uh, co-flotation uh, plants and uh, from multiple sampling points. So including flotation fade, flotation tail, and tailings, uh, signal overflow, and uh, and return um, water dam. So we, we collect uh, multiple samples and we measure uh, the MABC concentration. And uh, we, so the, the red columns show, uh, shows our results, uh, our method. And we compile this one with, uh, by using chlorometric methods developed by McGill University. So we found that similar trends, even in the upstream value are slightly different. So the trends uh, similar to each other. So this gives us some confidence that uh, we will do some further studies for the test. And we want to actually develop some uh, online tool, see whether we can actually 
build a prototype and uh, to demonstrate this uh, uh, in the plant environment. Um, so finally, just let me give a uh, picture, show you two slides. And so what if uh, we have a glyco-based fossil? Um, what if you have a frost blend, blend with uh, like a um, linear chain process and glycol-based process? So, and we worked with a uh, University of uh, Canterbury in, in New Zealand, Professor Daniel Holland. And uh, we try to use uh, benchtop and MR, so to try to analyze fossil concentration. And the, sh the disadvantage of uh, an MR is, uh, is uh, it's difficult for you to measure species at very low concentrations. So for flotation system, the dosage is typically very low. And uh, so we have to uh, have some enrichment first. So this is solid phase extraction. And we put into column and uh, we extract these frost molecules and then we use solvent to, to actually get this uh, uh, frost uh, molecules. And we found an interesting thing is uh, the recovery from here to here is uh, is fixed at a, at a different uh, frost uh, concentrations, typical flotation dosage. So for example, if the recovery is, so here is 80%. So for different uh, frost uh, concentrations, the recovery is pretty much 80%. So that gives us a basis and we can just measure the, um, this uh, concentration and then we can calculate based on recovery and we can estimate the frost uh, concentration in the original water sample. So with this, we can find a very strong linear relationship. Okay. And, uh, and here, just to give you one example, and we tried uh, the frost blends uh, MIBC with PPG with molecular weight, average molecular weight 425. And uh, so here, this uh, horizontal axis shows you the mass fraction, the known mass fraction. So for example, 0 0.1, PPG and uh, 0 0.9 uh, MIBC. So we found that uh, the measured the measured value for us to indeed shows these trends. Okay. So MIBC 90%, close to 90%. So slightly below 90% and, uh, and the PPG is uh, slightly above uh, 10%. So here on the right hand side shows you the absolute error and in, in PPM. So the accuracy is probably around, uh, so up to like uh, by 0 0.5 per ppm, which is sufficient for for the frost concentration in you know, a you know, flotation plant. So we, we need to actually do further tests in the in the plant environment. Um, so the the benchtop NMR is relatively expensive um, compared to the frost method we developed. So just formula liquid mixed. And uh, you can measure this in potentially in real time. All right, so in summary, and to that, <coughs> I showed you four different methods, two methods that are devoted to process intensification. And we demonstrate also that yeah, supply can produce smaller bubbles, can improve flotation recovery, and uh, greatly improve the throughput and current capacity. And low frequency sound can also improve flotation and that potentially can produce a cleaner product at the same flotation mass recovery. And we developed a drag sensor. This is a, the mass pool sensor that uh, can be applied to, um, to measure and monitor flotation mass recovery in real time. And uh, then uh, for the constant environments, uh, we use uh, two different methods. And first method is uh, useful for MIBC type frosser. And second one is uh, useful for, for all types of uh, frosters, including fossil blends. All right, so yeah, thank you. And, uh, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much, Dr. Wang, that was fascinating. Um, do we have any questions from the audience here? Yes, we do. Needs to be into the mic so we get it well recorded. Yeah, Ray um, I've got an obvious question. Have you have you tested uh, both the sound and the oscillatory uh, 
uh, air flow together to see if you get an even better result than, than so is, just one or the other. The question is, uh, have we tested the combined methods, like combining acoustic sound with also air? Is that a question you ask? Combining sound? Yes, this is one of the ITAP projects. Um, so we, we did some tests and we found the yeah, you can get better results if you combine sound with uh, Austria Air. Um, so Austria Air supply is, uh, is designed to produce smaller bubbles, generally smaller bubbles. And acoustic sound uh, has been designed to try to improve frost stability. So if you combine them together, you, yes, you will see the further improvement, yes. But uh, right now it's not clear whether there's a synergistic effect. There's some cooperative effects, so you do have better results. But uh, we do not know whether one plus one is greater than two. Yeah, we so need we to need further to test. test. Yeah. We need to work for the results there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I will let you know. <laughs> hey, thanks very much for your talk. Got a couple of questions. <laughs> one, first of all, I noticed with the oscillatory air, the recovery as a function of particle size, you had improvement at the at the fine end, the smaller part, and you had improvement at the, the coarser end, in fact, quite significant improvement at the very coarse. But in the middle at around 75 micron or so, there wasn't much change. Have you got ideas about why that may be the case? And that was question one. I can go to question two. NMR is actually a range of techniques. Um, it's pulse sequences, it's you name it. You didn't specify what specifically, what NMR technique or approach you use. Would you please specify? Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, so the first question related to flotation with uh, Austria supply for intermediate particles. Um, so we use column. Um, this is a lapse column, and we've already got very high recovery. Um, so, so you can see for this, uh, the particles, so for silic particles, suitable um, flotation particle size is probably around this for these two columns. Um, Especially for this one, we have already got a close to 100. So there's little room for you to further improve. Um, this is really a limitation for, I think, for the experiment setup. So we've already got a very high. And so the improvement is very small. Okay. And uh, likewise for the, for the other one, with uh, acoustic sound, we use mechanical cell and uh, the highly so it's high intensity agitation and so the off-plan particles have got a very high recovery, close to 100. So there was little room for you to further improve using acoustic sound. Yeah. So, and anyway, this shows you that uh, and if, we, if we actually design experiments at lower baseline, potentially we might see some further improvement. Um, unfortunately that uh, we apply a this is single mineral flotation, and we have to uh, have a reasonable stable cross um, and uh, hydrophobicity. So um, we already got a very high recovery for the baseline. <laughs> Difficult to further improve. Um, next, next question. So for the NRMA, so as I mentioned, because of limitation of time, and I only highlight uh, the contribution. Um, I forgot to actually include the paper. So we published two papers. Um, so one paper in minerals engineering, another paper is general of uh, magnetic resonance. And so we, we provide uh, detailed information. So what type of NMR we use, benchtop NMR used. And, uh, and, and I think the K is actually how to process the data, spectral data. Um, so Professor uh, Daniel Holland is expert in actually working on the NMR and or different types of NMR. And there's one quantum mechanics uh, analysis for the data. 
look at the area under the curve and try to actually extract information about fossil concentration from the NMR spectrum. So that is a um, that is actually key to how to actually differentiate the, the individual components from the frost blends. So, uh, I have no expertise actually to answer the question how to actually analyze data, uh, but uh, Professor Holland is, uh, is the right person to actually ask uh, more details. Yeah. And if you want to want me to send you the papers, you can let me know. Uh, just the email, email me. Oh, papers. Uh, we have an online question now from Rodolfo Espinel. Do you see more potential of the oscillating air and ultrasound technology with traditional tank cell flotation cells or with high intensity flotation cells? Okay, so the question is for these two different methods. One is oscillating air, another one is with sand. Um, are they applicable for, for the, a wide range of flotation, different types of flotation cells? Um, I would say that acoustic sound is a, a people for any flotation cell. So you, you can, you always have a overflowing frost, and you always have a space for you to insert some loudspeakers. Okay. Um, but the Austria supply, this method is only, is only a people for column. So the limit, just the limit type of flotation, like we're using diffuser, we're using air spudgers. Um, because for mechanical cell, um, there's no benefits because uh, osteo supply is not designed to actually to improve flotation of mechanical cell. It's uh, through the spudger and you, ch you change uh, steady air flow to osteo air flow and uh, you can allow early release of these air bubbles. Um, so you can create smaller bubbles. So must it be through a diffuser aeration diffuser through the spudger system. Um, the the spudgers are uh, in the past spudgers were used only in the lab. But nowadays you can see the trend and uh, more and more um, like the industrial new new modern flotation cells were designed with using spudgers. So I think the uh, certainly there will be some opportunities for like a column, especially column flotation to try to apply, to try this, this uh, methods using off the air supply. And uh, as I mentioned, we have already uh, considered how to scale up the, the conversion device. We cannot rely on this uh, sonar valve, okay, electromagnetic valve switching at high speed. Now that's only for low uh, flow rate. So for larger flow rate, and then you have to actually use a different design to actually be able to actually produce osteo at a high flow rate, which is suitable for industrial um, operation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Wang. I'd like uh, you all to join me in thanking Dr. Wang for giving this talk today. Okay. Uh, next week, we have Guillaume Lefort. Uh, founder and executive chairman of Clean Metals Technology, and he'll be talking about a process that they've developed for the recovery of critical metals from wastewater using cementation processes. I uh, hope you can all join us again next week for that seminar. Thank you very much. <laughs>